You won't hear this in church. God has good in store for all who go through judgment. Stay tuned. God is at peace with the world. He is at peace with you. How can this be? Jesus died for your sins. Jesus was entombed. Jesus was roused the third day. Stay tuned to the end of this video for an upcoming conference announcement and for links of other videos related to this video. Christianity teaches that Jesus is really good at judging, which in the end for the judge person ends up with them in hell forever and ever. On the flip side, when Christianity teaches about Jesus saving, they say that he's not quite as good as he could be because billions of people will end up either tormented forever and ever or dead forever and ever. They're wrong about both Jesus judging and his saving. In the hands of the Savior of the world, judging is a means to an end, not the end, which is the salvation of all, and God becoming all in all. True judgment, God's judgment, has a purpose for the judge and the judgee that go far beyond the actual judgment. God said to rebellious Israel in Amos 6.12, You turn right judgment into poison. And Christianity does the same thing. They pervert God's right judgment into something poisonous. Do not swallow it. I love this following quote from A. Enoch regarding judgment. Judgment is God's strange work. He uses it on the way men make it the end. No matter how an unbeliever is dealt with, whether he dies as a result of sin or by the direct intervention of God, whether he be cast into outer darkness or into Gehenna, this is not his end. All who do not belong to Christ will be roused from the dead and judged before the great white throne. God does not reach his goal in any of his disciplinary measures. These only prepare his creatures for it. Let us not confuse the going with the goal. Before we dig into our study on the judging, let's set the foundation for God's work and God's will concerning the salvation of all. 1 Timothy 2, 4-6 our Savior God wills that all mankind be saved and come into a realization of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator of God and mankind, a man, Christ Jesus, who is giving himself a correspondent ransom for all, the testimony in its own eras. Let's take a look at a key passage concerning the judging that will be done by Christ. In John 5:22 through 23 Jesus is speaking to Jews who were persecuting him and seeking to kill him, because he had healed a man on the Sabbath, and they said he was making himself equal with God. For neither is the Father judging anyone, but is given all judging to the Son, that all may be honoring the Son according as they are honoring the Father. He who is not honoring the Son is not honoring the Father who sends him. We see the current state of affairs in relation to man, Jesus, and the Father. Jesus said, He who is not honoring the Son is not honoring the Father who sends him. Again, he's speaking to people who accuse Jesus of making himself equal with God, the Father. And Jesus is telling them, if you're not honoring me, you're not honoring the Father. So the honor that was due to Jesus was not coming to him, so they were also not honoring God. You cannot bypass Jesus. You cannot skirt around him to get to the Father. He is the only way to the Father. If you do not honor the Son, you're not honoring God, the Father. To remedy the situation of people not honoring the Son and thus not honoring the Father, we read, For neither is the Father judging anyone, but has given all judging to the Son. What is the purpose that all judging has been given to the Son? That all may be honoring the Son, according as they are honoring the Father. So to remedy the situation with people not honoring the Son and thus not honoring the Father, all judging has been given to the Son, that all may be honoring the Son, according as they are honoring the Father. This is one of the great purposes of judgment, that all may be honoring the Son. Oftentimes judgment is presented as something that will be completely negative for the judge and the judgee. But here we have a positive outcome from all judging that will be done by Christ, that all may be honoring the Son. Now let's take a look at a few key words in this passage here so we can understand what exactly Jesus is talking about here. 
First, I think it's vital to understand what the word judging means. From the Greek word krino, which is Strong's number 2919, it means to set right, come to a conclusion, decide, and it can be positive or negative. Judging is oftentimes thought of as a negative, but when the judge makes a judgment, it can be positive or negative. So here we have Jesus doing the judgment, and this is speaking about the future judgment at the great white throne, which we will look at in just a moment. But we see that this judging brings about the positive conclusion that we're seeing here. Next, we have the word honoring, which is used four times in this passage. Honoring from the Greek tomeo, which is Strong's number 5091, it means to value, with the idea of revering when speaking of God and Jesus. So the judging of all leads to all honoring and valuing and revering the Son and the Father. Again, this is a great result of all judging. A few instances where this word honoring is also used help us to understand exactly what this word means as God uses it. In Matthew 15, 4, it speaks of honoring your father and mother. And this is obviously honoring in the way God wants you to honor your father and mother. In Matthew 15, 8, Jesus was speaking of those who honor me with their lips, yet their heart is far away from me. Now, obviously, the heart was wrong, but the lips were actually doing the right thing. The lips were saying the right words. They were honoring Jesus, but the hearts were the problem. Now, we can see here in John 5, 22, 23, that this is speaking of not just the honoring of the lips, but it's the honoring of the heart. This is the good result that will come from Jesus doing all judging. And we see in John 8, 49, it speaks of Jesus honoring his Father, which is obviously the ultimate example of what this word honoring means in the scriptures. And I want to bring in the idea of people repenting, that this is repentance at the great white throne judgment, because it says that all may be honoring the Son. Obviously, these people did not honor honor him before. And if we look at a definition of repent from the Greek metaneo, Strong's number 3340, it means to think differently, change the mind. Now obviously this is beyond just a change of the mind and to a change of the heart also, but when people go from dishonoring the Son and the Father to honoring the Son and the Father, obviously there is a change of heart and mind. So we have these people repenting at the great white throne based on the judgment done by Christ. The question then becomes, is your Jesus any good at judging? Will all of the judging that he does bring all to honoring the Son and the Father? If your Jesus is not successful in his saving and his judging, your Jesus is too damn tiny. This judging that Jesus will do that we just read about will take place at the great white throne, which we read about in Revelation chapter 20. Let's take a look at that now. Here we have in Revelation 20, 11 through 15, the scene at the great white throne judgment. This is the judgment that will lead all to honoring the Son as they honor the Father. So there is a good result from this judgment. And I perceived a great white throne and him who is sitting upon it, from whose face earth and heaven fled, and no place was found for them. And I perceived the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And scrolls were opened, and another scroll was opened, which is the scroll of life. And the dead were judged by that which is written in the scrolls in accord with their acts. And the sea gives up the dead in it, and death and the unseen give up the dead in them. And they were condemned each in accord with their acts. And death and the unseen were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone was not found written in the scroll of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. We're not told exactly how long this judgment will last. It will be a massive undertaking where Christ will do the judging. And this is a, a scene where we're not given a lot of details, but what we do see here is revealing. It's obviously very intimidating. Uh, this is a great resurrection of those who do not have Eonian life through the eon that includes the 1,000-year reign of Christ and his saints on the earth. If you can try to envision the scene here, people have been resurrected from the dead, probably many of them that never heard of Jesus. Most have probably been dead for quite a while, possibly thousands of years. They are literally dead. So the last memory they have, which to them is an instant right before this resurrection, who knows what they were doing? Maybe they were driving a car. Maybe they were having sex, drinking a bottle of whiskey. Maybe they were worshiping a false god. But now they're resurrected, and right before them is him who is sitting upon the great white throne. The earth has fled. The heavens have fled. There's no distractions at this time. I do want to point out what I think is 
a very poor translation by the Concordant Literal New Testament, which, in my opinion, is one of the best translations that you can find. In verse 13, it says, And they were condemned, each in accord with their acts. But in verse 12, it reads, And the dead were judged by that which is written in the scrolls in accord with their acts. These two words come from the very same exact Greek word. So why there's a difference in the translation here, I'm not sure. But the word judged is the proper translation. Again, as we said before, judging can be positive or negative. The great white throne tends to be looked at as only a negative judgment. But again, whatever was written in the scrolls in accord with their acts. I can't imagine that anyone has lived a life where all of their acts are evil. I can't imagine anyone living a life where all of their acts are good. It says here they are judged in accord with their acts. We know that Jesus is going to be a righteous judge. He is going to judge based on the truth. Now, on the negative side of this, it's not going to be good for those who are judged. On any positive side of this, I don't see that there's any rewards given here. But Jesus is the judge. He will decide the judgment that occurs for these people. Now their judgment and the results of their judgment will be dealt with at the great white throne judgment, not in the lake of fire where those who are cast there will be dead. Dead people are not judged. Living people are judged. We're not told how long this great white throne judgment will last. It could be a very short time. Maybe God compresses time. We don't know. There's things happening here that we've obviously never experienced before. The earth has fled. The heaven has fled. It's humanity, the celestial beings, God in Christ, and the great white throne. There's no distractions. All eyes are focused upon him who is sitting upon this great white throne. Now, there will be some after this judgment, as we see in verse 15, if anyone was not found written in the scroll of life, he was cast into the lake of fire, which verse 14 tells us is the second death. There they will die. But there are some who will be found in the scroll of life, and they will go on to the new earth as mortals. But again, as we saw in John chapter 5, all of this judging will be done so that all will be honoring the Son, even as they are honoring the Father. That is what you will not hear in church. This is just looked at like everybody's judged before they're cast into hell, they're tormented forever, they're dead forever. That is not the case. That is what Christianity teaches, but we have to understand there's a purpose for the judgment that goes beyond the judgment. This is not the end of anyone at this judgment. Even for those cast into the lake of fire, they will later be resurrected to immortality because death, the last enemy, will be rendered inoperative. Now let's take a look at an example of some of the worst among us, the wicked people of Sodom, and how they will fit into this judging. The story of Sodom's destruction can be found in Genesis 18 and 19. Sodom was judged and destroyed by God for their viciousness and their intense sin against him. There are not even ten people that could be found to be righteous within the city of Sodom. In Matthew 11, 20-24, Jesus is speaking to two cities that saw his miracles, heard his teaching while he was in person on the earth, and they did not repent, they did not believe in him. So he says this to them, then Jesus begins to reproach the cities in which most of his powerful deeds occurred, for they do not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the powerful deeds which are occurring in you occurred in Tyre and Sidon, long ago they would repent, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Moreover, I am saying to you, for Tyre and Sidon shall be more tolerable in the day of judging than for you. And you, Capernaum, not to heaven shall you be exalted, to the unseen shall you subside. For if the powerful deeds which are occurring in you had occurred in Sodom, it might remain unto today. Moreover, I am saying to you that for the land of Sodom shall it be more tolerable in the day of judging than for you. So we have Sodom and we have Tyre and Sidon that Jesus is speaking about here. Uh, very wicked places. Sodom is obviously known for its wickedness. But notice what Jesus said about these ancient cities that were destroyed. In verse 21, If the powerful deeds which are occurring in you, the current city that Jesus was ministering to, occurred in Tyre and Sidon, long ago they would repent, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. In verse 23, If the powerful deeds which are occurring in you had occurred in Sodom, it might remain unto today. Jesus is telling you that, that God knows exactly what it takes to cause repentance in a person, in a group of people, and in humanity as a whole. It's not a mystery for God to cause repentance inside of anyone, to cause a change of heart, to cause a change of mind. Repentance does not come within, from within us. It comes from without. God is the one that has to change the mind and the heart. But it says here that if he would have done 
these powerful deeds that Jesus did when he walked the earth, those people would have repented. So why did God not do for Tyre and Sidon and for Sodom what he did for Chorazin and Capernaum? Only God knows. It's his timing for them. It's his timing for Chorazin and Capernaum. But looking forward, since we know that God knows how to cause repentance, it's not a mystery for him. It's not too hard for him. Man looks at it like it's this great responsibility of man to repent, but it's God the one that causes repentance. That's why when those that preach eternal torment or an everlasting annihilation look to the future, they just don't see how man can repent. Man is so wicked. Man is so awful. But it says right here, God knows exactly how to cause repentance in anyone, and he does it in his timing. And that's why, based on John 5 that we looked at, that it's through the judging that he will lead many to repentance by causing them to be honoring the Son and the Father. And I also think it's important to note in verse 22 where Jesus says, For Tyre and Sidon shall it be more tolerable in the day of judging than for you. And he goes on to say in verse 24, For the land of Sodom shall it be more tolerable in the day of judging than for you. The judging that will occur at the great white throne is in proportion to the acts that are done. It's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. God is going to judge based on truth, based on what the people actually did, the light that they received from God, because obviously Tyre and Sidon and Sodom did not receive the same amount of light that Chorazin and Capernaum did. That's why Chorazin and Capernaum's judgment will be worse than Tyre, Sidon's, and Sodom's. As it says here, their judgments will be more tolerable in that day of judging. God is in control of all of this stuff. The judging, the results of the judging, bringing light and knowledge and understanding in his timing to all those that will get light and knowledge and understanding. And the result will be them honoring the Son as they honor the Father. God is not done with Sodom. He destroyed them, wiped them out with fire from heaven. But that's not the end of Sodom. They will be resurrected to a judging that has a purpose beyond the judging. God has final restoration in store for Sodom. We see this in a great prophecy from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 16, 53 through 55 from the concordant version of the Old Testament. This is God speaking. Yet I will reverse their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, and the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, and I will reverse your, Jerusalem's, captivity in their midst, that you may bear your mortification and be mortified by all that you have done in which you brought comfort to them. Then your sisters, Sodom and her daughters, they shall return to their former state, and Samaria and her daughters, they shall return to their former state. And you and your daughters, you shall return to your former state. This is God speaking to wicked Sodom, wicked Samaria, and wicked Jerusalem, and the cities that surrounded them, which he mentions here as their daughters. God is going to do a great reverse. He will judge, he will punish, but again, the judgment and the punishment are not the end. They're the means to the end. Here is the great reversal for Sodom, Jerusalem, and Samaria. God will reverse their captivity, and he's going to return them to their former state, the state of life. I think it's appropriate now that we thank God that he has a very big brain, a God-sized brain. He's got this all figured out. But a question comes to mind when you talk about the great white throne and all people being saved. People say, will Sodom come to believe and will those raised at the great white throne come to believe at the great white throne? I think the answer is yes, and I'll tell you why right now. If the judging that Jesus does is so that all will be honoring him and honoring the Father, would it be honoring to them to not believe in them. No. So I believe that their belief and their honoring work together. It all comes together at the great white throne. The judging has a purpose and the judging of Jesus will fulfill that purpose. But this raises a problem for many and pretty much everybody in Christianity because we're taught that people can only be saved in this life. And we're taught that people can only be saved and believe by faith. Now, faith being something that you don't see. That's why faith is required, because you don't see it. But, but, I like big buts. Jesus put his stamp of approval on believing by sight in his encounter with Thomas. Let's look at that, because this is so vital to understanding the salvation of all. That some come to believe by faith in this life, 
and will have Aeonian life, but those that do not will come to belief by sight. And let us not forget that it was through sight that doubting Thomas became, in actuality, believing Thomas. Believe it or not. In John 20, 24 through 29, we have the encounter between doubting Thomas and Jesus after Jesus' resurrection. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, termed Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples then said to him, We have seen the Lord. Yet he said to them, Should I not perceive in his hands the print of the nails, and thrust my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will by no means be believing. And after eight days his disciples were again within, and Thomas was with them. The doors having been locked, Jesus is coming and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Thereafter he is saying to Thomas, Bring your finger here and perceive my hands, and bring your hand and thrust it into my side. And do not become unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Now Jesus is saying to him, Seeing that you have seen me, you have believed. Happy are those who are not perceiving and believe. This passage puts the full stamp of approval by Jesus himself on believing by sight. Now he says, happy are those who are not perceiving and believing, and those are those who will have Eonian life, who do come to believe by faith without seeing. So the next time someone says to you, you have to have faith to believe, say, yes, that's true now. But that's not always true. Let's again be thankful to our great God with a great big God brain that all judging has a good purpose. And realize again and remember always that the judge of all is also the savior of all. Are you lonely tonight? Are you lonely and wanting some face-to-face -face fellowship with other believers? Or maybe you're curious about the salvation of all through the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. There are at least two upcoming conferences this year. I'll provide a slide with the information for one that is pretty much all set and ready to go. And the next one after that, we're just in the beginning stages of planning for the Omaha area in mid-September. I will keep you updated on that as myself, my son Seth, and William Fay are putting this together. William is William is the guy in charge. This is his idea, so um, we're going to be working together to bring a conference to mid-America. Hopefully we can catch people from both coasts coming in in the middle of September. Martin Zender has said that he is available for the days we're going to do the conference. He will be speaking and there will be some other speakers yet to be determined. But right after this is the slide for the upcoming conference in Virginia. Here we have the information for the upcoming Richmond, Virginia conference in 2022. Memorial Day weekend, end of May. Speakers, as far as I know, are Martin Zender and the pirate Mark Haukes. Mm -hmm. Contact Greg Davis at email unirec at protonmail.com. Enjoy the face-to-face. -face. 